going to <coughs> declare a quorum. Call the City of Groton Committee of the Whole for Monday, September 23rd to order. Court Project, please call the roll. President Mayor Pete Hedrick, Deputy Mayor Jamal Beckford. Councilors Lisa McCabe, Reginald Stanford, Guinevere Dufo, Mary Ortiz, Finance Director Ron Newhouse, Clerk Deborah Patrick, excused as Councilor Rashad Carter. Thank you. We're going to start tonight with item number 748, the donation request. And we will lead off with the Rodney basketball. Bonnie, if I could get you to come up and if you could. Uh, Bring the microphone and then grab a seat. That way you can be heard. Okay, Council, we have a request for the Grod Mystic basketball uh, for a donation. And uh, I've asked Ms. Tompkins to come here tonight to speak to this since there is no amount that was, specific amount that was requested to make sure that that you guys are, uh, that she talks about it so the, that uh, you guys can make a decision. Bonnie, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. So Groton Mystic Basketball is a new travel basketball club that we've started in the area for Groton City, Groton Town, and Mystic to try to bring everyone together. Um, we have some great recreation programs in the town and in the city, um, but Groton has lacked a consistent travel basketball program where area towns surrounding us all have one at this point in time. So, um, for those of you who may not know, if a child's interested in playing <laughs> basketball as they get older, your choices are rec, travel, what's called AAU at a local level, a state level, and a national level. But the problem is AAU is a very expensive program. In most kids, it's cost prohibitive. So you could have some kids who could be very involved in an athletic program, but they can't if AAU is the only option. We've had some sporadic teams in the area. Really, just a mom or dad would say, hey, I'm going to make a team and put some kids together. Um, but that wasn't generally open to the whole public. A lot of people didn't know about it. Um, last year, Eric Jamali and I had a team, and we realized that there were a lot of kids who had no idea that there were travel teams in the area. So we decided to pull our resources and start an actual club. Um, some of our goals of our club are to be sure to make it cost effective for our families. It is grades four through eight. It is girls and boys. We would like to have um, one, but at most two teams per age group. We have started a drills and skills to, um, to prepare for this. To be quite frank, we thought we'd have 10, 12 kids. We had 40 our first night. <laughs> we were a little blown away. It was a lot of kids in a small space. But, um, so we do drills once a week for the kids just to get them ready. We're hoping to offer an activity to engage middle school kids just to help keep them busy and uh, engaged, which is always a good thing. Um, so th this is a club that we started. We kick off in October. The season is October through March. We will play in two local leagues. There's one Connecticut Basketball Conference League and one up in Norwich. There are two different levels of competition. So it'll depend, each coach will decide for him or herself what they want to do. Um, some of our goals are to bring in community resources. So for instance, October 1st and October 8th, we have Coast Guard cadets coming to our drills and skills. Um, players from the men's basketball team to help out and run the drills and skills with us. We've contacted um, Mitchell College, Avery Point, Conn College, and the Coast Guard. They're going to offer coaches trainings for our coaches for us and also for the town recreation program. Some of their coaches will be invited along if they'd like to join us. Um, we're just hoping to try to make a program that kids can be a part of that's well advertised so all kids, regardless of their economic background, will have the opportunity to play. And any outside donations will help us to keep that cost down. Because we're a new club, there's some startup fees, and that's really what's you know the difficult part to overcome. Uh, we need basketballs, we need gym space, which requires rental. We have full insurance. We are a registered 501c3. We've gone through all the paperwork for that. Um, we will need uniforms. We will need league fees. We will need tournament fees. So those kinds of things come into play. All of our coaches are volunteer. All of our board members are volunteer. Uh, we have a six-person board, um, all people from the city and town of Groton. Okay. Do, <coughs> do you have a request amount in mind? Uh, we wouldn't be so bold. <laughs> I will tell you, our budget for the first year to run one team for each age group, believe it or not, um, is about $25,000. It's, I know it sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? It's a lot. It adds up. It's because each fee for a team to be in a league is 300 to 500 depending. Um, the uniforms run about $50 per person, but the real ticket price is gym space. Um, for instance, in years past, Grasso has been able to offer gym space 
um, free of charge, um, but that's changing. Um, you know, just a lot of liability laws now and things, so people have to pay for their space. When we do our drills and skills, that costs us anywhere from 50 to $75 a night to run. So those things add up. And again, if we can have 10 teams, which is like what we'd like to be able to offer, grades four through eight boys and girls, would be 10 teams, that's 10 practice spaces twice a week. That's where the money really comes in. Okay. Council questions? I guess I just have more of a comment. I, uh, I'm very impressed that we have 40 kids that want to yeah. come out and play basketball. Fabulous. I would have loved something like this um, when I was a kid. So, If I can mention, part of it started last year. We had a, a couple little teams. There's a Neil Hollick tournament, if anyone's ever played in that when they were younger. I know my husband did, and right, he's in his 50s. So we, we put some teams in the Neil Hollick tournament. And what was fabulous about it was when one team was playing, for instance, the eighth grade girls, we had the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade boys there. And out in the hall, all you could hear in Waterford High School was, here we go, Groton, here we go, Groton. And it was wonderful to have that community spirit, which is really a big piece of what we're hoping to do. Make connections with the college students, make connections with the high school kids. So there's just continuity and community that continues to be built. One of our major goals is to keep the cost down per player. Um, right now, with the budget that we have, we're looking at, at, at max $200 per family with scholarship opportunities. We've researched different scholarship opportunities in the area um, that offer um, scholarships for programs like this for families. So we'll have that. We'd like to eventually have our own scholarship fund to work from, but it's our first year, so that's not something we'll be able to do right now. Our real goal is to be between $100 and $125 per family. Um, but the 200 is what we announced so that everyone's prepared for that if they need to be. Okay, other comments? Um, Guess where it's Do they go? through a tryout to make the team? There is a tryout, there will be a tryout because we can really only afford to have two teams at this point per group. Um, so two fifth grade boys teams, two sixth grade boys teams. Um, but a, a little bit it comes down to, it is a higher level of competition. I mean, that's what we're looking to offer for these players. And sometimes putting a young player who's not ready for that level of competition isn't the best thing for them. So there will be some trials to be sure that the kids who are coming onto this team are capable of playing at a higher level of competition without it damaging their self-esteem or their desire to play basketball. Um, so we will have to have tryouts, but we do plan to advertise through all schools in Groton so that every student is aware that we exist and they can come try out if they'd like to. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, we haven't expended any funds yet this year, right? And we have. We have. Yeah. That's right. Mystic Falcons. Did, right. Mystic Falcons we did. You're right. Uh, so the rules are we have a total of $5,000. And no <coughs> one uh, donation request can be over $1,000. Over 20% of that. So $1,000. So. <coughs> Can I propose that we uh, we match what we uh, provided the Grant Mystic Falcons? And what, do you remember what we did for the Falcons? That was four fifty. Four fifty. Okay. Any other counselors? Any other numbers besides four fifty? That's what I was actually thought about earlier. When okay. I the proposal. All right. Uh, then through consensus is four fifty. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, then I'll need a motion to move this to the mayor and council meeting at 10-7, 2019. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Extension? Motion carries. Thank you very much Thank for coming. Thank you so very much. Yeah. That's yeah. wonderful. Good luck, Good luck with you. that. Okay, the next one is children first, Groton. Uh, this is... Uh, we have given to the we have donated to these guys before they're coming in with a request for a thousand dollars i think you guys okay everybody has that uh and then susan goes through the aspects of the program and what the money will be used for so i will take a number um <clears throat> Can I ask what, what we've provided in the past? Yeah, I was going to ask that too. I did not bring the historical list, but I believe it's been a thousand if I recall. Uh, my memory serves me correct. It's been a thousand. Now, we've had the discussion before about how people come in, they front load, and, and those kind of things. I think we're starting to see that. Mm -hmm. I think we're also starting to see that there are other 
uh, organizations that are going to request funds. Mm -hmm. So it's up to the council what what you decide what you decide you want to do. Uh, but what month are we in? We're in September. We start in July. It's still early. It's still early. So what's the will of the council? Do you want to go with what we've been, what we've done consistent so far this year, with the Mystic Falcons, and then now with the basketball, which is 450, or do you want a different amount? That's where I was thinking. It would seem appropriate to stay with the 450. Okay, mm -hmm. I agree. All right. <clears throat> I need to, I'd like to have a motion to move this to the Mayor and Council's meeting of uh, October 7, 2019. So second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion <coughs> carries. The next thing I'd like to talk about is 761, which is the fire engine, fire truck engine. Chief Thompson. Good evening. I'm going to be asking for a little bit more than $450. <laughs> um, you should turn me away right away. <laughs> I think in your packets uh, you had three uh, estimates. So our engine uh, 21, which is stationed at Eastern Point Station, um, has a bad motor. And we, uh, <clears throat> we had it diagnosed and, and they recommended that we have to replace it. So uh, it is going out to get some work done back at Pierce, who built it, the manufacturer. So we thought we were going to get it done there. Uh, but if you see, their estimate was $50,000, which was higher than I had anticipated. And they could not give me any documentation that I wrangled with them for a couple months. Mm -hmm. So we moved on, because uh, it's been out of service here for a little while, um, and got estimates from two, uh, two local uh, vendors. Um, Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's across the top says Oshkosh. That's uh, the manufacturer's uh, and the highest, uh, the highest estimate. Mm -hmm. We also got two from, uh, one from Corbels and one from Five Star. Um, at this time, I'm going to recommend we go with Five Star. It's the cheapest um, by, I think, 1700 It also, if you read their uh, estimate, after the engine's replaced, they'll do a pump test, which is required by NFPA. Corville's is a truly a truck garage. They wouldn't have that capability when we, you know, receive the truck back. We would have to go out and get it pump tested, uh, which would be an additional cost. Um, so uh, at this time, that's unfortunately uh, what we're looking at. The, uh, Ron would work that number up, but I think we usually put a five a five percent contingency on top of the. 36, 124, uh, 38. Um, and I did check that date is, well, I think July 11th, but um, I did just talk to the gentleman today. It is still, that estimate is still good. That price is still good. Okay. Comments, questions? So this is, this is labor and service? Correct. Okay. This is parts and labor. Parts and labor. Um, yeah, so that's why well, we thought it would be a little cheaper when we sent it out because uh, they were already going to have the truck pulled apart to do other work at the manufacturer, but it did not turn out that way. So okay. uh, that would be parts and labor. I think Five Star's uh, estimate is pretty comprehensive in what they wrote up. Um, and they work out of Hartford. They, they're affiliated with Freightliner. They do a lot of, they do tr fire to apparatus stuff, but Freightliner of Hartford does a lot of truck work in okay. general. So. Uh, they have a lot of vendors that they would be utilizing. And I just want to remind council, once the motor, once the engine is complete, we still have to send the vehicle off for the repair on the chassis. This is the right. one that is undersized. Uh, when we did the inspection, actually it was last year at this point, right? Or earlier this year? Yes, it's, it's, it was Late, late fall, I believe, when the whole thing started. The, uh, we had an inspection on the chassis and it's undersized. So we have to send that off to be repaired. So that's an addition. We've already authorized that amount. 
this council has already authorized that. So we need to get the engine fixed and then get it back and then send it up to uh, to the repair so we'll get a complete repair of the truck back. Okay, I need a motion to move this to the mayor and council meeting of 10-7-2019. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstention? Motion carries. Okay, we're going to move to seven. Thank you, Chief. We're going to move to 742 Groton Utilities. The first presentation we're going to have is Avalonia Land Conservancy. Okay, Rick, if you could come up and then bring. Thank you. So, for those that know me, I'm Rick Stevens, uh, the manager of the Water and Sewer Division. This is Julie DePaul Woody from Avalonia, Land Conservancy. So, just as, uh, and also Kate Blacker is here, and Kate Blacker is a uh, watershed surveillance individual who works for Groton Utilities, and she's been doing a lot of the uh, legwork. In fact, Julie uh, left the uh, three ring binder, a place that she actually put together with all the tabs that we worked out over the past three and a half days. So just as way of an intro, when Alex Chisholm was utility director back in the 80s, he looked at this one piece of property and said, that's a really sensitive piece of watershed property in our watershed owned by someone else. And he tried to make a deal to purchase the property. This property was also, we had a consultant come in and look at the most sensitive property within the watershed. And this is on that property. The original drawing is in your, in your book. And it was listed as the number one or number two priority back in the 80s. What's happened recently is that there was a development, and Julie will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was about 70 house lots. 73 house lots right in the watershed. So you can imagine the impact from septic systems, from chemical use, fertilizers, and just the development, the sediment that would go in. So um, we looked at um, Avalonia, in fact, Julie DuPont Woody came to me and said that Avalonia applied for a grant from the state through the DEEP, there's a grant program. And it, it was almost six or eight months process of applying for that. The application was about this thick three, three ring binder. And Julie did a, a, a lot of that herself with scientific help. So they were successful in getting that grant. And that grant is what, a 60? 65 percent. 65% grant. And then also received funding from the town of Ledger, who's really excited about this. So what it offers Groton Utilities is a way to protect watershed property without having to own it. You know, with this, we're looking at it, it was a million point one. So without having to own it and have a, a, an organization like Avalonia Land Conservancy uh, employ best management practices in that area. Some of the area will be for hiking for those people who live in the community. There'll be trails, they'll be marked. Um, but there'll be a defining line where the land, excuse my drawings, but where the land comes like this and then there's a slope down. That In that slope down, that's a sensitive area in a watershed. You have sheet flow and runoff. You have wetlands that help to purify the water. And also you're approaching the reservoir roads in our water right there. So Avalonia has agreed in an MOU to let us put signage on that line of property and demarcate it that this is watershed property and there's limited access. The access would be for scientific study with different organizations, students, universities, what have you. So it provides, like when someone asks you, how come we can never hike in watershed property? Well, it's obvious because of the sensitivity, but you can say, go on the Avalonia Land Conservancy website 
and you'll see there is opportunities within the community for families, students to have, you know, to get outside in nature and hike. And there'll be defined glyphs and signs and that kind of stuff. So from ground utility standpoint, it's a great relationship to take us into the future and um, to protect the water source where our first level of treatment occurs. But Julie, do you want to talk about Avalonia's um, interest in Yeah, so um, uh, as Rick said, I'm, I'm on the board of directors of Avalonia Land Conservancy. Um, this project is something that we've been working on for quite some time because of its value. Um, this property has extensive wetlands throughout um, over 100 acres of this property, of these, this project, are highly valuable wetlands. Um, one of the great things um, about wetlands is that they provide um, free water filtration. Um, the creatures that live in the wetlands um, provide that filtration at no cost to us, and they protect our drinking water. Um, and so this, by protecting this property and with the partnership and support that we get from Grant Utilities, we can protect this property from the 73 lot housing development. Um, and Avalonia is also interested in establishing um, a relationship for education about watershed protection and watershed value um, that we don't really have um, in the community now. And, um, what this partnership does is it helps create that education program and that partnership to show the people who are walking on Avalonia properties why we need to protect the watershed um, for now and for our future and for our children's future. Um, there's uh, a real economic benefit in the protection of our watershed. Um, and so that's what this, um, we hope, is the start of a long-term relationship for education and for protection of valuable property. And a lot of these details were put in an MOU, which we worked on for the past month. So in tab two, towards the back end, there are two pages uh, entitled a memorandum of understanding. It is in draft format. But several items there are for the best interests of the city and for the utilities to protect the watershed. And most of them are from the city side and to your side. And Avalonia has agreed to these conditions in the MOU. And they're kind of what I basically explained previously. This is <coughs> consistent with Ground Utilities' philosophy of watershed protection and uh, keeping water purity levels high. This was presented to the Utility Commission last week and was overwhelmingly accepted and approved by them and therefore it's, re it's referred to the Council for your consideration and for your recommendation. So any questions for Rick or Julie? Councilor McKay. I, I'm just trying to understand. So this this property is owned by so, someone who wants to develop and put the 73 houses. Right. So what you're trying to do is protect the lands and not so that this is not buildable Correct. because it is watershed. It will be protected in perpetuity. Um, and uh, this is the way to accomplish that so that um, essentially a conservation easement is placed on the entire property forever. Okay. And that, that would give you teeth, right, to protect this, right? Yes. Okay. Also, Ground Utilities wasn't in actively involved in the writing of the MOU so that our interests are represented as well. Any other questions? Is there any Stafford. Is there any um, financial cost that um, private utilities have in regards to this? Yes. The, That's why we're here. Right. So there, there is a contribution that we would make. So, and you don't have the basic price, and Julie can give you the definitive okay. to the sense, but it, it's about a $1.1 million investment that Avalonia is making. There was a 65% grant through the state, and then there was fundraising on their part 
So the contribution, which I think is about 12% of GU, would be $159,000. No, no, 459945 is the exact. Yes, in the very end of the If you. Tab 2. Tab 2 at the last page, like the recommendation. Okay. Well, that's true, but I, I want to take you to. To the budget. If you look under tab 742. The last resolution that's there talks about the $159,945, which is being requested. Okay, sorry. Tab 2 gives Avalonia's presentation about the book. If you go to the your 742 that was in your packet, my apologies, I'm not clear. Nope, it's, it's after that. It's the very last... Present it's the very last uh, uh, resolution. Mm -hmm. It's a resolution of Mayor and Council authorized Garden Utilities Management to enter into an agreement with Avalonia Land Conservancy Incorporated PO Box 49, Old Mystic, Connecticut, and contribute up to $159,945 in those cents to support the purchase of the Atkinson property as presented to the Commission, together with such revisions, clarification, and amendments to the agreement as the director of utilities shall deem appropriate and to execute and deliver the same on behalf of Groton Utilities to be paid from the water division retained earnings. So that's that's additional background that was in your packet this weekend. So mm -hmm. is everybody to that one? So that is the resolution that we're discussing and that I will, I will ask you guys to move. Any other questions or comments? So how is this going to affect the uh, budget for the water division? Is this going to change rates at all? Is this going to have any effect? That these well, I'll give you in, the in terms of rates, mm -hmm. Councillor. Mm -hmm. um, and our director's here, but as far as I've been aware of, the monies would come, as the mayor said, out of retained earnings. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't be having to borrow or, or obtain any additional sources. We've also in the past tried to budget for reserve accounts to be able to reserve certain portions. And what we did um, with before, before Ron was looking at the financial information, what we did before is we would then take that monies that we wanted to put into reserve accounts and it would go to retained earnings. So let me answer your question this way. Let me give you a definitive. It will not. It will not impact rates. So let me answer that question. The, the next part is, in the budget they had set us today. Water division has set aside ninety thousand dollars for such a request. This request is a little more than that. It's one hundred fifty-nine thousand dollars. So the ninety thousand dollars is already budgeted for. The other amount will come out of the the. Uh, retained earnings and that's why it's come before you as the council. You had to go through the commission first. Uh, let me think what else. Also, uh, some of you may remember that the council used to be the, well, no, it doesn't matter. The Connecticut general statutes require that if there's any rate change in electric water or sewer that has to be done either by the by the commission, the utility commission, or in the case of sewer, the WPCA, and that water pollution control authority, and that requires public hearings and everything else, and we are not doing that. And there's no for this amount that's here. There's no reason to raise rates for this. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions for Rick or Julie or comments? Okay, I need a motion to move this to the Mayor and Council meeting at 10-7-2019. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. Motion carries. And thank you. Thank you very much for coming out. Okay, the next thing I'd like to talk about is the data storage array. That is the, the it's two resolutions up.
Sue Blanchett, the general manager of IT, to talk about the data storage array. Okay, you have your resolution. Okay, the resolution's there. What's right. the number? Well, it's, it's the third one up. It's for 195,335. 92. Okay. Okay. Sue? Good evening. Mm -hmm. During the budget preparation process for fiscal 1920, the IT department identified the need to replace our yeah, existing data storage array here at the municipal building. During that time, we began the research about a year ago to develop a framework for that replacement and as well as get pricing for budgeting purposes. Our proposed uh, and approved budget for 2020 includes $206,000 of non-bonded capital for that purchase. Once that was approved, we continued our research because the purchasing policy allows us the opportunity to quote based on a solution rather than a standard bid. These items are not standard. They're not something that you can purchase off the shelf or get a competitive bid on. You essentially have to choose your manufacturers and different technologies and make your determination based on the total solution. So we've done extensive research in both traditional data storage arrays, currently what we have now, and the new hyper-converged data storage. It's a newer technology. It would be compatible with our existing systems. However, it was cost prohibitive. This purchase for traditional data storage arrays, 195,000, which is well within our budgeted amount, a hyper-converged solution, which if you uh, compare it to having a calendar on your wall, a phone on your table, and an address book in the drawer, and now they're all on your smartphone, that's essentially what hyper-converged is in the data storage world. Every component is in a single unit. Single unit fails, it all fails. That's a concern, obviously. So uh, the pricing for hyper-converged for the newer technology is $331,000, well exceeds our budget. So we chose to pursue the traditional at 195,000, hoped for the initial cost being far less, uh, and the long-term costs of support with annual renewals being far less. So it's short and long-term savings for us. Okay, council, questions? See, so I, I have uh, just a I guess a, a question on what, what's the difference between like a, a, a storage array and maybe like a server farm? Is it is it the same thing? Is it just like a... Well, essentially, a server farm could be a connected group of physical servers that could provide a certain amount of data storage between them. One of the constraints of space in this building is that we don't have space for physical servers with data storage on each one. So we need to find uh, our way to a virtual environment where we can have less equipment, taking up less space, less energy, less consumption of air conditioning and so forth, and using a data storage array attached to that virtual environment is what allows us to keep a very small footprint. Okay. Any other questions? So you're saying that I'm, I'm new with this. No, it's okay, go ahead, Cash for Teach. Uh, I'm not very good with computers, honey, but um, you said we can save. Um, if we go ahead and buy what you're selling, would you be able to show how much we're going to save? Well, right now, the initial amount, uh, we, are, we are in a virtual environment now. So we have already realized our cost savings for electric and energy usage and air conditioning costs. So that had happened nine years ago. Um, in the interim right now, the manufacturer of one unit, the hyperconverged unit, and the existing unit that we have, their long-term costs for continued support annually is twice what it would be for this particular manufacturer. So there's a, a savings there. There's also the initial savings of 
$331 purchase versus $195,000 purchase. Thank you. But we have realized our, for nine years, we have realized our reduced energy costs. Councilor McCabe. Just the, um, those two numbers, the 300 whatever thousand and the 195, is that for a comparable amount of space? Mm -hmm. Comparable amount of space, completely different technologies. Okay. The newer technology, as you all know, when the new TVs come out, right. they're very expensive, and a couple years later, they're not. And it's the same with this. It's right. newer technology, and it's and it's much more expensive. Okay. Perhaps in a few years, it will be less expensive, right. but right now, sure. it's still quite expensive. Just, just another kind of question is, um, did we look at like any, I'm not sure, I guess, how, I'm unsure of like how critical it is to have the data here versus like in the cloud. Did we look at that? Yes, we did. Mm -hmm. And there's a number of different reasons why we have it here. Um, first and foremost is that we have a number of different um, departments that we need to protect, including our police department and their data. Uh, CGIS has not authorized cloud storage for anything to do with the police department. So we would have to have um, data storage here for them. Then we have our AMI solutions. Should we put any component of that in the cloud, it disconnects the auto feed of data between every element. There are seven different elements of that process, and that would disconnect them from each other. Um, right now, that's pretty intricate. We want to keep it in one place so that we can have the instant communication between them. Mm -hmm. And then there's the, the potential fail of pr providing all your systems in the cloud and you lose your single internet connection. Right. You've, you, you've basically lost everything. The other, the other feature of being in the cloud is that you're dependent on that vendor to provide all the services all the backups, all the security that you would normally do yourself. You can put it in a contract, but if ransomware attacks, they will only, per contract, give you back the cost of the contract. Other than that, you're on your own. When you're here, it's protected in your own way, by your own people, with your own experts, in the appropriate way across the industry. Yes, from McCabe. Did you look at on-prem clouds? Essentially, that's what we're doing. Okay. <laughs> All right. Any other questions or comments? Okay. We need a motion to move this to the mayor and council meeting at 10 7 2019. So moved. Second. Now, a motion to second. Further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Extension motion carries. Thank you, Sue. Thanks, Sue. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is the Stantec presentation. Ron, would you like to come up and introduce this? And then we'll need to take the microphone back to Chris and Chris. Sure, as the council may be aware, we actually have Stantec as the uh, manager for the water filtration project. The water filtration project is a $54 million project that's going on uh, hot and heavy over in operations and um, there's a lot going on. Over the last couple of months we've been watching the contingency. Uh, the contingency started at about 4.7 million. We came to council about uh, six months, eight months ago to talk about PCBs and we did an initial change order on the order of magnitude of 1.7 million dollars. 1.7 million dollars is a lot of money. We were thinking about what was going to happen with the concluding of PCBs. We actually did that 1.7 million dollar change order and had council authorize on the order of magnitude of about 2.2. It was either 2.1 or 2.2. There was about another 400,000 knowing that we were going to need to come back and address the PCB issue. Um, now that we're actively addressing that, we've come up with a combined change order that combines some delays on the project of the order of magnitude of five or six hundred thousand and then another five or six hundred or five or six hundred thousand dollars to finish and conclude the PCB issues. So that just, that order of magnitude of change order coming through 
the mayor and us, we discussed it and we said, Let, let's make sure we go and update to the utility commission and to city council so everybody understands as we see change orders coming in the next couple of months, there's gonna be multiple, whether they're small ones or large ones. We need to let everybody know the status of the contingency because the ordinance that was passed allows us to spend a total of $54 million, no more, with RH White on construction and with Stantec on project management. So with that being said, um, Chris Yanoni and Chris Nichols, Chris Yanoni is the vice president of Stantec and he's the lead on this project with Stantec. Chris Nichols is our frontline project manager for the project. Both have been with this project since its inception, which goes back eight years. Longer? Yes. <laughs> so, so with that being said, they're going to give an update. We asked them to give an update that starts with a kind of the history. Please feel free to stop and ask any questions. This is supposed to be conversational, and you're talking with the guys that have the history and know the facts. PCB issues? Is that what? What does that stand for? It's an acronym I'm not familiar with. Okay, that clears it up. <laughs> so, <laughs> why, why, are, why are PCBs in? Uh, okay. Used heavily back between 1950 uh, to the early 80s as a additive to oils for transformers, additives to paints, additives to caulking make it much more flexible and durable. Okay. And so that was before we knew it was a carcinogen. Thank you. Okay, so um, my name's Chris Yanoni from Stantec. I've been involved with the city since the late 90s on a number of different drinking water projects. And this is a great project. It's um, not often that cities go through putting in a new water treatment plant. In your case, the last time this type of work was done was probably in the 60s, and it started in the late 30s. So your plant was constructed generally between 1938 and 1960. So this has been, what, 19, uh, 2019 to 1960? That's about 60 years. So it's about time to put a new plant in, and it's a project that I think the community can really feel proud of. It's got a lot of new technologies, and I was here about three years ago where I did a presentation to help get the appropriation needed for the project, which was about $54 million. So as Ron said, please feel free to interrupt me as I go along. I've got probably about 15 slides to go through a little bit of the history and update you on the project costs. So specific to this project, we started um, a conceptual design report and a pilot study. So pilot studies are small scale models of the proposed treatment technology to apply to your specific water in your watershed. As you heard earlier, you're doing the right first step by putting in certain uh, measures to protect the water quality coming into the plant, but even with that, you still need to remove certain contaminants that are coming from the reservoir. So we pilot tested dissolved air flotation and granular activated carbon. Those are two uh, very good technologies for your type of surface water supply to remove contaminants and bring them to within the, the drinking water regulations that are regulated by EPA. Um, we got done with that study in 2009 and uh, prepared the report with a, a, a very conceptual level cost estimate of what the plant would cost. And then in 2013, we started the preliminary design of the plant, about a 30% design. And then in 2014 is when the project really started moving. Um, there was SRF funding generated for the project through an application that was submitted to the Department of Public Health. And the 30 and 60% design plans were generated. And of course, these plans and specifications are needed 
to map out what you want to build for contractors to bid on. Um, because of the value of this project, the state requires an independent consulting firm to review the design and to see if there are any changes that would help improve the project, whether there are changes that would lessen the cost of the project or even changes that would increase it because it brings value to the project for this 50 to 75 year investment. So we got done with the design in 2016, at which time it was submitted to the Department of Public Health for their final review. And then in 2000 and, um, late 2016, the project was advertised for bidders. There were about five or six contractors that put bids in on the project. And the project was awarded in May 2017. And then the notice to proceed for the contractor was August 2017. It's a three-year construction project. So we're expecting to be done you know, around this time or maybe a few months later into the year next year. Any questions? Go ahead. The site for this, it, is it on the site of a current plant? So you have to do the the demo and then build on site? Yes, so um, that is one of the complexities as a design engineer to make sure that the plant's remaining operational without well, yeah, compromising awesome. the water quality. So we worked very closely with the operation staff. They were actually really part of the design team. They really knew how the plant needed to be operated and how to keep it operational as we phase the different parts of this project. Okay. So I'm going to show you, um, this is good timing for your question. So um, these facilities here, uh, this is uh, 1938. This was the first facility built when there was only like a 2 million gallon per day demand. And then this facility, this was unit one, unit two, this was about 4 million gallons per day. And then this is unit three, and that's about six million gallons per day. So the total is 12 million gallons per day. Those three units uh, were the existing facilities built between the 30s and the 60s, and they're being rehabilitated uh, exterior and inside in order to provide all completely new systems for chemical feed, for um, electrical service for heating and ventilating for office laboratory administrative type areas. So those are the existing facilities. And then, as you said, we had to keep these operational in, in terms of the design and keep it a phased approach. This building is a completely new building in an open area. And that's where the major new treatment processes are. That's the dissolved air flotation and the granular activated carbon. Those are the major processes. And then these are two new one million gallon tanks. So, so far I think the, the phasing has gone as expected without any um, delays or impacts to the operation of the plant. So I've, I've kind of touched on this, but just to um, get into a little bit more detail. The electrical and mechanical systems are over 60 years old. It's really hard to find replacement parts for them. So when there is a failure, it's a little bit of a concern from a reliability standpoint. Fortunately, you have a, a really um, uh, skilled staff that's able to keep things operational when there are issues. Um, you know, these days, obviously, energy conservation is very important. So we have a, a new building envelope that improves the insulation and reduces the heating requirements of the facility. And we have a geothermal heating and ventilating system, which will help reduce your energy costs. The elevated water storage tank helps provide additional fire protection and emergency storage for your growing regional supply. If there's a problem at the water treatment plant, those tanks will help continue to provide water while repairs are being made to the plant. Um, the dissolved air flotation system and granule activated carbon systems, those are new technologies. Right now you only have a foot, foot and a half of carbon in your filters. This provides four feet, which is an improvement. Um, it includes 
uh, retrofitting the existing filters to uh, filters specific to the removal of manganese, which um, isn't a health concern right now, but from an aesthetic quality standpoint, it creates black water, which obviously is a problem for customers if they're seeing black water in their, dr in their drinking water. So this w will remove that issue. It's also being considered as a potential public health issue in the future that EPA is still researching and studying. So by putting in this technology, you'll have addressed that. Um, it's got a new process control system, so the automation will be completely new. It'll allow the plant staff to monitor and control the new processes at the plant as well as all the remote processes in the water system, which is the water storage tank levels and pumping from the pump stations throughout the system. And trihalomethanes is another contaminant that EPA regulates and there are aeration systems being installed in the storage tanks to remove those contaminants. Any questions on those, those items? Um, from an operation standpoint, this is something that, um, you know, once a designer is done and walks away, the, the plant staff and the city are left with these systems. You want to make sure they are friendly, operator friendly, easy to maintain, reliable. So this is where it was also very helpful to have a lot of input from, from the Groton operations staff. So from their perspective, the electrical op grade will help improve the equipment compatibility and reliability. Again, this is where they've found a lot of issues and having a hard time finding spare parts. The mechanical pumping and piping systems, um, replacing those address the age of that equipment and its uh, need for greater reliability and efficiency. Um, from, a, from an efficiency standpoint, some of these mechanical pumps, uh, the motors are being, are being replaced by energy efficient motors, so you've, you're having a better energy efficiency there with the pumping equipment. Um, some of the buried and internal piping, I mean some of that piping out in the yard is, you know, 1930 vintage. Uh, it's very, very old, so replacing 1910. I, was, I didn't want to take a chance and go back earlier than that, but it, it's very old and it's being replaced with, with new yard piping that, again, improves the reliability, minimizes failure of those critical water mains, and also inoperable valves. Um, energy conservation, that's more uh, on the order of the uh, HVAC equipment, a more uh, energy efficient system. The shell outside of the building helps insulate the building, reducing energy costs. Uh, the finished water storage improves, increases the capacity for fire protection. And the uh, process control um, gives uh, the, the plant staff increased flexibility and reliability while maintaining regulatory compliance. So, um with all, all the change in, in how we're running our business here, um, I assume you're going to be training the, the current staff. Is there going to be increased job positions or decrease? Um, the, op the operations crew is going to drive the majority of that after the plant comes online and everybody's trained. Um, initially, we're going to need a heavy operations crew, mm -hmm. so we're going to stay as is. There is a chance that the plant could go unmanned at night at some point in the future. So currently it is manned 24 hours? 24 7, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's actually one person on second shift and there's another person on third shift. As this plant comes online, there's a good chance we will be running uh, two people on second shift and two people on third shift, uh, depending on, uh, on the system and how reliably the control system comes online. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the new automation will, gives you a little more flexibility to reduce operations staff. Um, the, the actual technology, it's really pretty much the same except for the dissolved air flotation system has some, um, an, a little additional pumping and some air compressors. 
So from, a, from an operation standpoint, it's not a, a lot different from what you have now in terms of new, more training for the staff. That piece of equipment does require a little more training. All right, so talking a little bit about the um, advantages of this new treatment and chemical systems, the, the clarification system, the dissolved air flotation um, basically has little tiny air bubbles that float the particles up to the surface. It's completely different from your current situation where you have these big, huge tanks and you're adding chemicals and you're allowing gravity just to kind of settle those particles down and out of the drinking water. The issue with that is the particles are so light, it's hard to settle them down and they'll carry into the filters and then that's what the filters are responsible for removing. With the dissolved air flotation, it's a lot easier to remove these light particles because they're, they're just naturally easily floated out of the water. So the water quality coming into your filters is going to be much better and then the water quality coming out of the deeper filters with four foot of carbon instead of a foot and a half is going to be a lot better. So you're going to see a lot better water quality between both the clarification and the filtration processes. The filter process also has a special pipe system that allows you to waste the water away after the, you backwash it and re you remove the, the particles that clog the filter. When you put a filter back online, usually the first five minutes, the water's a little dirtier because it's the filter's what they call ripening and getting more particles in it so it's providing better filtering. So the first five minutes is usually water quality that's not as good and this additional piping allows you to waste this away and then you turn it back to the, the pipe going into the system and the water quality is better. Um, I touched on the manganese removal contactors. Not, uh, a, a lot of plants will add chemicals to remove the manganese. This plant is actually less chemicals and is just using a special media that will naturally absorb the manganese to it and remove it to well below the, the limits. Um, the trihalomethanes is, is something that's um, caused by adding chlorine to the natural organics in the water. It's something that all systems have to deal with and there are certain regulatory limits on those. Um, there's aeration being provided in the water storage tanks that uh, degasses the trihalomethanes so that you're, you're operating within the regulatory limits there. So that's kind of a quick overview of the importance of the treatment and chemical systems. Any other questions on those? I did have one. I did oh, have sorry. One Go question. ahead. It's probably a little delayed, but in no. regards to the new building and being energy efficient, yes. are you going to put um, solar panels on the roof or anything? Or would that compromise anything of the way the building has been built? Um, so solar panels were looked at briefly. This building is a very large energy user, so there's not a lot of offset you're going to get for them, and unless you can get into uh, uh, solar energy credits program where they buy your credits every quarter, right. it is very hard to make uh, uh, photovoltaic panels cost effective. Okay. What we have done is we're putting on what we call a rain screen system around all the habited and heated sections so it's in a lot of places it's a 12 inch concrete block on the inside of the building uh, four inches of uh, three inches of insulation uh, solid insulation then an air gap and then another metal panel on that side to deflect the rain and snow and the elements and that system will give us a very um, high R value about uh, twice of what's required in the building code. We've also put on four inches of insulation. You saw a lot of the windows in some of the earlier pictures. You, you saw there the steel angle window with a single pane of glass in them. Right. So that's probably the worst energy efficient, oh, I mean, just slightly better 
energy efficient than having a big opening in the wall. Um, so we're getting all uh, triple, I think it's triple pane glass in there. Okay. Uh, with the reflective uh, laminates in there so they can uh, keep the building cool and uh, warm in the winter. Okay. Um, and reduce, um, we put in two, in addition to the geothermal system, there's two condensing boilers for the system. And those uh, are natural gas boilers, not um, fuel oil that they had before. Um, and the boiler they had before, we took just took out this summer, was probably circa 1972 era. So this and the condensing boilers are much, much more efficient. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. All right, just a few photos of where we're at right now. This building here is the dissolved air flotation granular activated carbon building. These are a couple of the new emergency generators that, that provide the standby power in case of power failure for the facility. And right now, the new mechanical systems, pumping systems, and process systems are being installed inside those buildings. So from a schedule standpoint, I'm not sure how easy it is for you to see this, but we're just about exactly two-thirds of the way through the project. Um, what's been pretty much close to complete is the, the piping outside the plant and the water storage tanks. In about three months or end of the year, we expect the pumping systems to be complete. And the dissolved air flotation and granular activated carbon uh, processes are expected to go online in providing water to the city in February, March time frame. After that, um, the manganese contactors are expected to be completed in about a year from now. And then the final building improvements, site improvements, um, and project closeout. So, um, from a schedule standpoint, we're about exactly two-thirds of the way through and expect to be done uh, fall time frame next year. Any questions on the schedule? Okay, from a, from a cost standpoint, um, the contractor that was selected had a bid amount of $44 million. Up to this point, what we've approved and executed has been about two million dollars of change orders, which is about four percent of the total bid. What they've um, invoiced to date is about thirty million dollars, which is about exactly two thirds of the forty-four, leaving about fifteen million dollars to go. So, their cost kind of mirrors the schedule. Everything's about two thirds of the way done. From a total project pricing perspective, this is uh, what we presented about three years ago, which presented the breakdown of the contractor's bid and how much each of the different components cost on the project. Um, the total project, uh, as appropriated uh, three years ago, was $54 million, $44 million for the, for the bid, and then another $10 million or so for the engineering and the contingencies. So one of the purposes of this meeting is to talk about the contingencies and to kind of update you as to where we're at. Um, when we're talking about a rehab of an old plant, we, we want to have a higher contingency because of the unknowns that might be uncovered. Typically, we go with a 5% contingency, <coughs> and that's what the state will typically approve. However, knowing that this was a rehabilitation of an old plant, they approved us going up to 10% contingency. And the reason the 10% was approved <coughs> was, again, because of the age of the plant, the scope of the re renovations can be extensive and will likely uncover systems that are unknown at the time. They may uncover hazardous building materials, and if the period of construction is long, 
as this one is, it's about three years, 36 months, then weather events may impact the construction <coughs> schedule and time. So moving into the project, we, as Ron said, we had about a $4.8 million contingency. So I'm gonna step you through about where we're at right now with that. So here's, here's the original con contingency, but it's 4.728 million. As Ron had summarized before, there was a $1.7 million PCB change order that was executed already. And there's a proposed one, including schedule uh, delays, that was about $1.35 million that we're still negotiating. So the total relative to PCB change orders, if this is accepted, would be $3.1 million, bringing the contingency down to $1.6 million left in the contract. The 3.1 million is about 7% of the contract, of the, of the, uh, of the construction contract. And as, as you remember, we had a contingency of 10%, so that leaves about 3%. The non-PCB related change orders, what's been executed up to this point is about 390,000. And what's currently been negotiated but not executed or proposed is about 210,000. So the total of non-PCB related change orders is 600,000. 600,000 is about one and a half percent plus or minus of the contingency. So between the PCB related change orders and the non-PCB related change orders, we're at about eight and a half percent, leaving a percent and a half. And that would bring the change uh, available contingency down to a million. And then finally, there have been some engineering amendments that have been executed for the assistance sampling and, and technical assistance on the PCBs for about 310,000. There's a proposed amendment for 125,000 to continue that assistance for this $1.35 million change. And there's about 360,000 of non-PCB related engineering change orders, both executed and proposed. So the total engineering amendments, both executed and proposed is about 800,000. Bring that contingency down to 233,000. So that's something that is lower than where we would like to be at this point. Um, and we've identified some options that can bring some contingency money back in, depending upon how things evolve as we get closer to the end of the project. There should be less risk now that we are out of the ground. The foundation's complete for the plant. The, all the underground, pretty much all, all the underground piping is done. There's still some to be completed. There's still work in the existing treatment plant, but most of that work is in open spaces where we can see what's there, it's not like we're uncovering things that we're not expecting. So obviously our hope is that we're not gonna be seeing a lot more change orders, um, but at this point in time with both what's executed and what's proposed, we've got about 250,000 plus or minus. Hey Chris, can I interrupt real quick? Yes, go ahead. Can you give me an example of something that would be in the proposed change orders for non-PCB change orders? Something that's proposed but not executed. You want to take that? Sure. We have, uh, uh, we're trying to install a, a pump in one of the openings that was already there. And when we excavated down underneath uh, the building to make the connect tie into the existing pipe, we found that it is a lead joint pipe connection. So we thought it was a mechanical joint pipe connection. So now we have to pull that whole assembly out, put a new assembly in, a new valve in, um, so we can connect to the pump. Gotcha. Any others come to mind? Don't start them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to be honest, the PCB percentage is more than what we want. And this non-PCB related is very low, is very low. So they're kind of offsetting each other. If we don't have any more, then we'll feel pretty good. Mm -hmm. If we have more, then 
obviously we need to make some adjustments to finish within the 54 million. So these are some of the thoughts we, we, we have ongoing. Again, um, a good amount of that contingency that we showed isn't finalized, so, and we also don't know what might or might not be coming up. So we don't know if we're going to have to take these out of the project, but if we have to, we can consider doing that to keep within the 54 million. So first of all, there's four or five items that we can uh, remove from the construction contract that we've estimated at $250,000. There's a couple of items on the engineering that can be done um, either from other sources or potentially by, by GU staff, which is record drawings and O&M manual. And then there's also 300000 under the GU project management and legal budget in the project. So. If you added up all those, those three items, it would add up to $850,000 and bring the contingency up to a million dollars total, which would make us feel a little more comfortable being you know, over 5% uh, contingency remaining in the, in the last 16 million or so. Um, in terms of what those particular construction-related savings item could be, they include under a small portion of the building that's on the back side of the building facing the, the operation side. Uh, so it's not really affecting the aesthetics when you look at the plant from the front. You could eliminate that rain screen system on the chemical building and the rapid mix extension. Um, the, the operation staff could demo out some of the old chemical feed equipment that's right now in the contractor's responsibility to do. But in order to make everything work, that doesn't have to be taken out. It could be taken out at a later time. The plant staff could do that work. The plant staff actually has installed several chemical feed systems. And from my perspective, that quality of that workmanship is equal to or better than the contractors out there. So they've, you've got some very skilled and talented staff here that could do some of this work. Um, they could also renovate the office area on the second floor instead of the contractor doing that and do some of the modifications in the pump station that lifts water from the reservoir to the plant. So there's a couple of items that we could potentially consider depending upon if there are any other change orders coming on down the pike. Hey, Chris, can you just be a little more specific? Yep. Eliminate all the work in the rapid mix extension. What does, what does that mean? <coughs> okay, right, right now, they pump the water up from the reservoir into what we call a rapid mix basin, mm -hmm. and that's where they add the chemicals for the, the coagulation to settle, out, settle stuff out. Well, in the f future, we're going to be pumping from the low-lift building, at the, pumping from the reservoir, right up to the head of the new DAF facility. So that building extension piece is not going to be needed for anything in the future. So there's a big mixer in there with like a 40 horsepower motor on it. There's some slide gates. There's a new door that's supposed to go on that um, and some other minor pieces and parts that are in there. Um, I think there were windows, there are windows also going in there, new windows. So I mean, we could look, because that's not actually going to be used for anything in the future. Um, and it's a big tank. Uh, well, it's not a big tank. It's about the size of the inside of that uh, square that your tables make. Gotcha. So um, and the plant staff have also retrofitted the existing sedimentation basins to put in the new flocculators, which are just smaller uh, mixers, and, um, so they have experience doing that type of work. If you if you didn't put like the windows on that rapid mix extension area, are we just risking like losing <coughs> you know sinking energy costs there? No. No, no because that is completely separate from the rest of the building. It's unmanned. Um, 
we don't even need to heat it in the future. Mm -hmm. It has its own separate entrance, and um, yeah, there's really no reason for anybody to be there okay. in the future. Thank you. So why are we not uh, removing the building? As opposed to adding windows and well, that's a lot more money. <laughs> okay. All right. Because it's it goes down about fifteen feet below grade. Okay. Yeah. It's actually a pretty small component of the facility. Can you see it from here? No, you can't. It's like it's like up further. It's right 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 behind this building. Yeah. It basically provides the mixing for the chemicals going into the treatment plant right now is what it is. Mm -hmm. It's just this, yeah. So, you know, if it were bigger, it would be obviously more than a combined $250,000 savings. You know, if it was a big part of the building, maybe we could save half a million, but, but they all add up. All these little pieces add up in terms of potential savings. I guess I have another question. So if GU does this, I mean, is this, is this overtime? Is this? Uh, the way it would work is um, we were looking at holdbacks that if we get through the project could save construction costs. It would have no impact on water quality or system operations. So the office area, this building just fixing up the looks of it and internal stuff so that it could be used for storage maybe later or just the looks. Um, it would be done basically on maintenance time, probably not overtime. There would be no reason to do overtime. That group doesn't do overtime for projects. Um, they, they have a maintenance crew that performs upgrades as they maintain the system. Sure. And so you feel comfortable that in these maintenance times we would, you would be able to complete the projects within the, the um, scope it, of the, the original project? The goal at project? this point would be to track anything that was in scope that fell out of scope and then we would actually track uh, that as a separate project internally if even internally by work order so uh, we would actually track what it cost us to do that out of uh, instead of our flight time okay go ahead finish and then i have some things to say after the council I think I think that was the last slide there. Any other comments from council? All right, so here we go. Let's talk about this. Why did I bring this to you? We have 15 months left, and we're down to $283,000 in contingency. I have been concerned about contingency from the get-go. I have <clears throat> talked about we need to what we need to look at this. If you go back and look at the information. We started with a 34 or $37 million plant back in 2014. We're at $54 million. So how did we get there? So part of that is fan tax fee from the engineering fee, but part of that is the cost went up. But nowhere in here do we figure out PCBs. We put $600,000 aside for PCBs. We're up to $3 million now for PCB removal. This was not, in my opinion, this was not identified up front when it should have been identified. We're now having to deal with this, okay? Here's the other thing. <clears throat> we went back and pulled the resolution. The resolution says we are gonna spend $54 million, period. That's what the cost of this project is gonna be, $54 million. Now, that's not going to be the true cost of this project because there are things that are within the scope of the project that are not gonna get done. I have went <coughs> public and said that based on where we are with contingency, that we are not to do anything that would technically impact this water treatment plant or the capability of this water treatment plant. I have also said that the Freeman do not have the stomach to go back to them and say, we need to borrow more money. So where are we? And the bottom line is, when all said and done and we're cutting a ribbon and we're eating cake, it's gonna be a $54 million project. The true cost of this project is gonna be a lot more. Why? If you look at these things back here, 
there are going to be things that are going to be removed that were supposed to be done, but there may be additional costs. There are going to be things here that now the staff are going to have to do. Can they do it? Absolutely. This staff, the water treatment staff, are tremendous. They have tremendous capability, have a wonderful work ethic. So how does this get paid for? It cannot, based on the resolution, it cannot come out of cash, and it's not going to come out of it's not going to come out of anything else. It is what will happen is these projects will get postponed or but rebudgeted in in the future year budgets. Now, one of the things that I've asked for is to so that I can provide it to the utility commission and to the council is a list of the cost of all the things that we end up having to do above and beyond so we know what the true cost of this is. I, we, I owe it to the commission, I owe it to you, and I owe it to the freemen. We owe it to the freemen so that they know what we have here and why. Okay, That's a, this, is, this is huge to me. When I, when I found out there was an additional $1.3 million coming for a PCB and that has not come to me yet for change order because it has not come to you. I was not happy with that, and, and I said, I want an accounting. If you guys look at this budget, it's similar, uh, spreadsheet rather, it's similar to the number that Chris has. Chris has 233 left. This has 283 left. There was some additional uh, money that was added back. But this on the side, PCOs, these are pending change orders, and then the COs are the actual change orders that have been approved and or signed. So you can get a basically a breakdown of what is going on here. But it was important to me that you as the council and that the utility commission, as the commission knew where we were at this point in time. We are two thirds of the way through the project. Actually, there's about 15 months left. And there's we're going to be at estimated 283, 233 left. Now, something else is going to come up. Now, there's a couple other things that have not been identified. When we removed material, dirt, from around the foundation, a lot of that dirt was PCB contaminated. That dirt has not been sampled yet. It hadn't been sampled, right? I want to make sure. Some sampling has been done. Has it been? Do we know the results? The, uh, about uh, a year ago, <coughs> excuse me, about a year ago, some sampling was done in situ of the soil. Yes. And that, that was, came back clean, and that was stockpiled separately. This larger stockpile from around where the rest of the building was has not yet been sampled. Um, the sampling plan is being finalized, my understanding, this week between our environmental science people and GU staff. So that, so that has not been sampled yet, so we don't know the results. How, how, much, how much dirt is there, roughly? Do we have any idea? About 6,000 yards, I believe. Okay, we have 6,000 yards of dirt that is potentially PCB contaminated above the limits. The disposal of that dirt is not included in any of this. The purchase of new fill is also not in here. So there's a lot of things that aren't yet accounted for as far as what we're going to, what the cost is. And that's why we're now GU and Stantec and RH White are looking at what things cannot be done that would not negatively impact capability of the plant so that we could keep it out within $54 million. We had a discussion with the DPH, Department of Public Health, and DPH asked me where the city and the utilities wherewithal was. And I said that we are committed to finishing this project, and we are. We are going to finish this project. There may be things that are within scope of the project that do not get done under this project under the $54 million 
and therefore will then have to be uh, handled through different uh, to through a different process, meaning the budgetary process. But that's why I wanted to make sure that you guys knew where we were, because uh, of what was identified. We still now let me let me also add this for full transparency. The PCB removal and abatement and captivation that we are talking about are certain sections of the plant that were identified for the construction of this plant. We will, because of the widespread use of the paint that contain PCBs, there will be portions of this plant that still has PCBs that will not be abated after this project is completed because it wasn't part of the project and it was not in scope. Now, as soon as we identified that there were PCBs in the paint, I contacted Jim Healy. For those of you who do not know Jim, Jim is our safety representative. We came up with a plan. We did a sampling plan, both airborne and surface with Mystic Air Quality to ensure that our staffs was not being inadvertently exposed and that there was no health hazard to them. That was confirmed through sampling. There was no airborne and there was no loose surface. We have implemented procedures. Uh, if you look at mitigation of safety issues, there's engineering, there's administrative, and there's PPE. So the abatement and the captivation is engineering part of it. The administrative is that we have labeled it and we have put into place protective measures so that during the operation people know what to do and what not to do and if PPE is required if they if let's say for example they have to drill on a wall in order to put a wall stud in then they know what the proper PPE is and then use that PPE but I just wanted to be 100 percent clear as to what the real status, 100% status, as I know it, to the commission and then now to the council and to the freeman. It's important to me that everybody understands where we are and we are still working on a way ahead uh, daily. And as I get additional information, I will keep you informed. So now, any other questions or comments from the council? David Mayor Beckford. I do. So <clears throat> it sounds like, so it sounds like, I, I know this is a, a long project. You guys said you've been in discussion since 2007. I am, imagine that maybe there's some sort of, uh, I mean, I don't think we're going to, are we going to see any more? I, I mean, I guess nobody can predict the future, but is there a checklist of things that maybe we should have looked at when planning that? Can we look at that now and just make sure that we're not going to hit another? Well, and that's the question that I've asked. What's the next thing that's going to bite us? Sure. And we have smart people trying to forecast and trying to look. It, it appears that the construction is almost completed. If you look at the timeline, we should put the plant online in March, April of next year. So if we're not doing any new excavation and we're not uh, disturbing any additional piping then there should not be any more surprises now let me caveat that with it you know we could always have challenges with piping fit ups we haven't got to the testing phase that may identify areas that require rework uh, uh, let me think what else uh, Well, those are the things that immediately come to mind, but but we do have people that are looking at this to, and, and we're, we have the engineering construction management group, that's Stantec, the oversight engineering. We have RH White, and we also have uh, our own staff that is heavily involved in this. And the DPH is uh, providing some oversight as well. They're still looking at our invoicing process is set up, started out very well and is immaculate. So the invoices are being scrutinized as far as the
the work that's being done to the contract. The issue here is the additional work and if there's anything else that's going to come up that uh, would eat into contingency. But there, there's there's no list of like, hey, check the paint, check the, the soil, check the, the pipes. There's no, I'll, like, you know what I'm saying? I'll, I'll defer that to you. Do we have any kind of a list or anything that we're using to try to identify any potential do we, do we know we've checked off the list for every site that we're working on currently? Do we know that we've looked at all these different materials? So all the new materials that are going in, we don't have any concern sure, with, sure. with those materials containing pieces. What we really have a concern with um, is when we've got to make that last hot connection into an existing pipe. Those are the places where we um, have the greatest risk on it. Um, you know, it, yes, we do have a checklist that we go through and do the hydrostatic test on the piping networks. Um, we do uh, then go through the disinfection process before we can place it into service. Um, and there are checks to make sure that, you know, we've checked all the connections uh, for leaks and anything else before we place it into service. Um, there are checklists that we make sure we go through and have op draft operation and maintenance manuals before the contractor wants to go put a system online. And we go through a whole process to put that system online from basically a, a dry checkout process um, where we just physically, is it the way it's supposed to be? Yes or no? Um, then we go through and we'll test that subsystem for leaks. We'll test to make sure the motor's in the ro rotating in the sure, right direction. Sure, my so. question is more on the materials, like, you know, well, any kind of materials that might be, you know. Let me add to this. Like, is there any additional new construction, either external or into the internal to the plant, which in the process of performing that new construction could uncover another either hazard or another potential problem that was not previously identified during the engineering phase. Is that right? Close? Right. I just want to make sure we're systematically, you know, yep. crossing off the list okay. and making sure we're not going to find something else somewhere else, you know? Um, right now, we've probably sampled almost every exposed surface in, in that plant for either uh, PCB contamination, lead contamination, um, and lead, and asbestos, yeah. So there aren't a whole lot of areas left with a drop ceiling in them um, that we haven't been behind, uh, so. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Councilor? Anything else? Ron, anything else that you want to? No, I, I will state at this point, you alluded to the DPH, Spantec, us. There's, this is one of the best agent, set of agencies I've seen come together with good communication amongst everybody, all the way to the Utility Commission to Council at this point. This, this project is fully discussed at all levels. Um, so I, I just want to thank everybody for listening know that you've got engineers working diligently to make this successful. There is no doubt in my mind that once construction of this treatment plant is completed and once this plant is put online, it will be the top-notch plant in the state. And the technology that is in this plant with the aeration and the deep bed charcoal filters and the manganese contactors will allow us to meet water quality standards that are not yet identified or created. And this plant will go into the future up to another 50 or 70 years. We are the, re we are the, wa we are the region's water provider all the way out to Mystic, all the way up to Preston and beyond and over into Montville and beyond. And, and water is one area that we are continuing to expand. So this will allow us 
to continue to, to provide the high quality water that people have grown to expect from Groton Utilities. So I do want to make sure that we end on that note, that it's a positive note. Anything else? Okay, Chris, Chris, thank you. Ron, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to 742. The Univar Solutions purchase a caustic soda liquid. This is the first one under 742. From now on, I'll, I'll probably quit jumping around, so this should be easier for, <laughs> for council to follow. My apologies. Okay, Director, if you could lead us. So one of the chemical systems that operations is actively working on upgrading uh, is internally we worked on the engineering and are actually constructing the chemical feed system. We're moving from a lime dry system where they actually put bags of lime into a system and blow it into the water to change the pH to a liquid feed caustic system. In this process, um, we needed to be caustic, the liquid that we're going to fill the tanks with. So what we did is we competed the caustic system and we have awarded it to the low bidder, which is Univar. The operations crew has worked with Univar before, so we believe that they will be a quality supplier, and this is the award of that bid. The money is budgeted. It's currently spent on dry lime, and it's just going to move over and be fund the caustic. Questions for the director, McCabe, Councilor McCabe? Yes. Are the, is the, is it cost comparable from the lime to the caustic soda? Um, what I believe it is comparable. It's within the same budget. So costs are definitely the same or lower. I'm not sure how much lower. Uh, the true, the true indicative indication on that will be where we end up after the first year. Because they've done um, preliminary trials and it looks favorable at the, at the dosages right, that they right. thought. But we really need to make sure it goes in the system and mixes. Also, the new system is going to have a different flow path, so it could affect the way it mixes in and where they test it. Any other questions or comments? Okay, I need a motion to move this to Mayor and Council to a meeting of 10-7-2019. So moved. Second. We have a motion to second. Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Extension. Motion carries. Neighborhood Assistance Act. So you may not have anything for this. This is an annual that comes through the system. The Neighborhood Assistant Act is a state program where we get credit for our gross receipt tax. So basically, we get a tax credit, and we write a check to um, an approved 501c as determined by the state. So it's dollar for dollar, no cost to GU. We just write the check. We deduct it from our taxes, if I'm not mistaken. Right, and we get the credit. So it, it, we just write the check, and then normally um, uh, it's a local, because we give first to the city, second to customers, and then if not, we'll, we'll reach out further in the operating areas. Any questions? We need a motion to move this to the Mayor and Council yeah. meeting at 10 7 2019. So moved. Second. Excuse me. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstention. Motion carries. And the next one will be the gas insulated circuit switcher. Um, this is a switch uh, that the electric company needs to replace. It is not a budgeted replacement. It was identified as failing two months ago, so it was not budgeted. So this will be coming out of available cash. Um, the switch is in the Buddington substation and is actually on the transmission level, meaning that it deals with 115,000 volts. These, uh, these circuit breakers actually operate in this gas so that there's no sparks and there's no wearing of the metal that connects. So there's no spark. 
it doesn't wear. The gas is leaking and the operations crew is actively, every time it, we get the alarm, we have low gas. The switch won't operate when we hit low gas. They run out and they fill it back up. And um, that's actually a violation in our operating protocols. So that switch needs replace. Any, any questions, comments? Hearing none, I need a motion to move this to the mayor and council meeting of 10 7 2019. So moved. Second. Motion to second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Extension. Motion carries. Okay, we're going to go to 561, which is Groton Utilities Financial. This is informing. So based on all like this meeting, we'll keep this very brief and to the point. Um, there really isn't a whole lot to talk about. We're still early in the budget year. Um, so if we want to just quickly go to page three, which is the electric division. Um, comparative income statement for the fiscal year today and all that I really want to point out here is on line 25 the total revenue we had budgeted 9.9 .9 million and we're right at 9.9 .9 in actual we're a variance of 8,580 there's a little bit of variances between the categories but in total it's right on budget from a revenue standpoint operating expenses are under budget currently by 411,000, so the net income from operations and the electric is currently under budget, um, or actually over budget the net income by 420,000. So right now everything's kind of in line from the revenue standpoint with the budget. Expenditures lag a little bit just based on the cash basis, but there's nothing to, um, that stands out currently in the electric. And if we flip to page eight, we're told to kind of do the same thing to the water division. Line 21 is the total revenue. The budget was just over 2 million and we're currently at 2.078 or 67,000 to the positive above budget in the revenue. And that's mainly due to the industrial where in the prior year they were actually below average, which is what we use to create the budget. So they're back to their usage. Um, same thing with the operating expenses, below but as electrics below budget of 230,000 Therefore, operating earnings are up 300,000 over budgeted currently. And again, we're early in the year, so that's sort of just kind of going through this fairly quickly. And there's, again, nothing that's standing out. Flip to page 12, which is the sewer division. And you'll see this actually correlates right in line with the water division as far as the revenue goes. That revenue usage wasn't, didn't have anything to do with deduct meters, so you'll see that that um, actual is 415,000, where the budget was 309,000 or 106,000 over budget currently for the revenue standpoint. Operating expenses, about 40,000 under budget, so therefore the operating earnings are 145,000 over budget currently. So right now everything's just kind of running along and there's nothing that is jumping out. Questions on Jews, but okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Appreciate it. All right, we're going to go to 760 vehicle purchasing. There's nothing in the packet for this. This is more oh. an informational. Um, we, we actually have a bid out right now for a couple of vehicles that are in this year's operating budget for the highway and for the building department. Um, or, or those, I believe it closes Thursday. Um, and what we'll do is we'll take those um, bids that come in, go vet them through the process, and then we'll have something for you on um, the first October meeting. But we just wanted to let you know that we are going through the process. There's nothing, we don't have the actual final results yet, but once we do, we should be able to vet that and have something for that first October meeting for you. We just want you to act, see something for the first time and not know that. But it is, they're in all these departments' budgets for this fiscal year. There is no meeting next Monday. It's the fifth Monday of the, of the month, so there is no meeting. Uh, we'll have the breakdown of this, of the vehicle purchases for, we'll break them out separately for on the October. So I need a motion to move this to the October 7th meeting of 2019. 
So second. We have a motion to second. Any further discussion? There's, there's nothing to move at this point. We don't have an oh, action you're not? item. We don't have it because the bids aren't in yet. Okay. So we just, it was more informative. So this is informing? Just, yeah. Just, regard just, that, just so that way we can bring it to that first meeting and that the council is aware that we're currently in that process. Okay. But we, we don't really have a vendor amount at this point. Okay. Then I'll take that off and we're not going. This is informing then. Six city budget presentations also informing. And this, um, again, with the budget year being early, next month we'll get back on to doing the um, month to date for the general fund. Currently working with the auditors, so we're wrapping up the 630 19 um, year end. So, what I'm hoping to also have for you next, Cal, is final numbers from the general fund side with some small adjustments, but for the most part, final, just so everybody can see where that did fall, kind of fall out at the end of the year. Okay. And lastly is number one, appointments Eastern Regional Tourism District. That is to point to me as the Eastern Regional Tourism District Board of, to the Eastern Regional Tourism District Board of Directors for a period of three years. The what I attached was the Connecticut General Statutes associated to this. This talks about the the Eastern well it talks about the three districts who's required to be represented in those districts. And at the top of the second page, it says the each regional tourism district shall be overseen by a board of directors consisting of one representative from each municipality within the district appointed by the legislative body of the municipality and where the legislative body is a town meeting by a board of selectmen. Any such board of directors shall serve for a period term of three years. And then that's it. There's some additional information, but that's the information that you need for this particular section. We, I, I attended a meeting a couple weeks ago. There were some challenges the way that their bylaws was written was a little bit different than what the Connecticut General Statutes required. The bylaws implied that municipalities, the 43 municipalities did not have to have a represent, representative from each one. That's not what the C Connecticut General Statute says. We're in a process now of, of reorganizing this group. They've had some challenges in the past not being able to have a quorum because they didn't have enough membership. In addition to that, uh, there is $400,000 at stake for the tourism district. Each of the, the DECD, the Economic Development, Economic Community Development, the department, they equally distribute the money over the, the three districts. So there's $400,000 at stake. And if we can't get a quorum, that means we can't spend the money. So that's why this is important. And that's why, uh, and these meetings are during the day. That's why I added myself on here. Plus, we have some challenges. We're going to end up rewriting the bylaws to make them more consistent. We're going to reconfigure committees <clears throat> and the vote and the uh, officers and basically the, the everything is is going to be reevaluated so that's why this comes before you so mary is, is this the first time that we're sending a representative to this body no we had a we had a person uh on, we had an individual that was representing us. That individual died. Mm. Uh, somehow, we didn't replace that person. Let me take it back. I don't. I'm, I'm, I think it's. Let me just put it this way: the person it was not there, was not filling it. I received a phone call and said, "Hey, can you take a look at this?" I went to the first meeting. That was. It was just before the last. Uh, Council meeting, I didn't want to bring it to you cold at the council meeting, so I want to bring it to you now at the Committee of the Whole. Uh, but there are other people that are not, there's a whole bunch of people that weren't represented. It's, it's going to be a challenge because there's 43 members, 
In addition, you can have an additional 21 members. That's potentially have 64 members on a board of directors. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, that is unmanageable. Mm -hmm. But those are the rules which we were given, and we're going to have to figure it out. Uh, there were some decisions that were made earlier this year to spend a couple hundred thousand dollars. A, in my opinion, a, a meeting should have been called, a special meeting. It wasn't. So therefore, the, the chair, the chair, the executive committee, which are basically the officers, made the decision to go spend the money. I understand why they did what they did, but that's not in accordance with their bylaws. In addition to that, here it is. We're in September. The fiscal year started in July, and they don't have a budget yet. And the reason they say they don't have a budget is because they don't know how much money they're going to get. Well, that's not entirely true. We know we're going to get $400,000, so why don't we already have a budget for this year? So these are the kinds of things that we need to address on this committee. And that there are some new members that are going to actively participate in order to help make sure. They need rules and procedures, people. That's why I'm going to this. And that's why I come before you for the appointment. So if any questions or comments? Okay, I need a motion to move this to the Mayor and Council meeting of October 7th, 2019. So moved. Second. We have a motion to second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion carries. And let me make sure. <laughs> we have a finance director, you have. Uh, I just want to go back to 561 really, really quick. Okay. There's the annual report, which is submitted in your packet that was signed off by the mayor and the director of utilities. So that's just in your in your packet. Mm -hmm. So I just it's, wanted to because that wasn't a separate one. So. You're right. It's getting to you now. The requirement is to have it to you. Uh, the charter talks about the 31st of August. So it was done then. It now it is now this is the first cow we've had correction committee of the whole that we have had to to deliver it to you. Is there anything else? Then I'll take a motion to adjourn. I so move. Okay, we have a motion. Second. And a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Essentially, we are adjourned. Thank you for coming out. Thank you.